No, yeah, that's better. Nothing. Okay, um, as Rick said, my name is David Glassman, and um, I'm, among other things, I'm a local historian, author, but um, tonight I've got the curator of the celebrated Women of Fruit exhibition, uh, which is why I'm here to talk about one of the celebrated women, and I'll say a little bit more about that later as we're going through the, um, the slideshow. Okay, so we are filming this because a lot of people have asked if we could film it, so. I hope you've got your phones on silent, as they say. That would be nice. We're also going to leave the doors open, but if anybody finds that distracting, then we'll be happy to close them if you prefer it. Just shout, okay? So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to do a short piece about the history of photography in about six minutes, because um, we want to try to put Alice Seedy and her photography into a kind of a historical perspective. Because if you read the history of photography, you'll hardly ever see the name of Harriet, Harriet Seaton, which is really rather important to that history. That's the first one. Then David is going to talk about Alice's life, literally her history, uh, where the photography came in, what she was doing, why she was in the Congo, and so forth. And then, as I'm sure you've seen uh, or know, Alice took some pretty horrific photographs of what was going on now, there were good photographs of a horrific scene, not horrific photographs. Um, but they were pretty horrific, and they did change the course of history. And we are going to show you some of those photographs, and they're not, not the faint-hearted, so uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see what we talk about. And then we're going to have a discussion, because it raises a lot of issues about photography, about history, about colonialism, about what happened in Africa, all kinds of stuff. So we hope it's going to be pretty interactive. Okay? So, five minute history of photography. First photograph of a human being, basically, in a photograph. A lot of people know that, for some other daguerreotype, 1838. And it was also uh, the first commercial process for photography. But it was only one off. When you took a photograph, you couldn't do a copy. And this one, however. Could, could I request that those, those two spots are put off so that the screens. Right, ah. proceed, please. I don't know how we do that. Do we know how to do that? Thank you. Thanks, Orkar. We'll go sort that out. Can I keep going while this looks out? Okay. Uh, obviously, William Fox Tolbert, we all know that from Lincoln. He invented a process which allowed multiple copies to be made of the same thing, which became really the future of photography. Uh, what's interesting, when you dig into the history, you find some uh, some facts you don't expect. When you read a history of photography, most people will say the first photojournalist was either the British Roger Fenton, this guy, or this guy, Matthew Brady, in the Civil War in America. But actually, it was this gentleman who was from Bucharest. And he never gets credit for being the first photojournalist, so he has something in common with ours. Roger Fenton, he used uh, daguerreotypes to start with and used the same process as everybody else, colloidal. He did the first sort of war photographs. But at that time, you couldn't get action pictures, so you're always shooting things after the fact. You could shoot cannonballs, you could shoot the disaster. In Brady's case, obviously, you shoot dead on the battlefield. But there was no live action. It was in the past. What had happened was gone. And that's the kind of camera that Brady used. Uh, interesting fact about him, he spent $100,000 taking 10,000 plates and the US government had promised to pay for them and they didn't. That would be about $1.8 million of today's money and he died penniless. But he, he created one of the best archives uh, of the Civil War, of any war in fact, for that matter, and has a place in history. Human rights photography, the whole concept of human rights didn't start until quite late relative in this story. This is one that backfired. It was actually in Indonesia. It was taken in 1904, so it was about the same time as Alice. 
but it was meant to demonstrate that actually the local people couldn't look after themselves. They needed colonial rule. So it, it was a piece of human rights photography that, was, that went wrong. Um, but it's often quoted as the first example of human rights photography, whereas actually that should be Alice again. So as you see, I'm trying to put Alice in perspective with what the current history of photography says. If you read the history of photography, you'll find that Lewis Hine, who actually took some absolutely fantastic photographs, is usually quoted as the first serious campaigner using photography to change something in society. And he was hired by the National Child Labour Committee in the States. And he was taking photographs of children in factories in terrible conditions. And in fact, he did help lead the campaign, which changed the law in the States. So he rightly has a place in this history. But the date is 1908. A lot of Alice's work was 1904. But again, you don't see that in the history. This is the first Kodak camera. It was loaded with a 100 exposure uh, emulsion. You literally took the picture, took the 100 shots, sent the camera to the factory. They sent you back a new, new camera with 100 shots in it again while they processed the pictures. So it was one click, job done. And it actually changed photography forever. It's quite often the case that Alice is quoted as using the Kodak camera. In fact, Mark Twain wrote this about Alice, called Mark Twain's soliloquy. He was part of the campaign to change what happened in the Congo. And there's a piece in this where he says that, I think it's in this, no, maybe it's not in this slide, it's that one, um, that it was the Kodak camera that made the change. Actually, Alice did use a Kodak camera occasionally, but she also used this, which is a German Swiss camera, which is just as good as anybody else's camera. So there should be no implication that Alice was taking pictures with a Kodak, and all the other people were taking photographs with serious cameras. It's again another part of Alice's story. And in fact, if you read a lot of the biographies of Alice, they'll always talk about the Kodak. But David and I were saying earlier, they don't talk about this camera. Because there aren't any pictures of Alice using the camera. And just to round off a little bit on the technology, Alice and her husband John uh, did a campaign in the UK, Europe, and the US, and David will talk about that, uh, showing the atrocities in the Congo, and they used machines like this, um, which were uh, magic lantern machines. But the innovation they brought to it was they told a story. They had a beginning, setting up what was happening. They had a piece about the role of Leopold. They had a piece even about H.M. Stanley. Remember Stanley and Livingstone? Yeah? He was actually one of Leopold's commissioners in Belgium when these atrocities were happening. But that's not a piece of history you normally get to hear about. Uh, and then they showed the pictures of the atrocities. So they literally wrote a modern AV presentation with a script in a slide order, 60 slides, using devices like this. And the other technology, which you should know about, is this. Um, rubber. Because this whole thing was about rubber. And I think you're going to say a little bit about that when talking about the apartment. Yeah. So now? Yeah, lovely. There you go. Okay, thanks, Mick. <coughs> right, lovely. So, let's say, Mick, to give a, an overview of where we are towards the end of the 19th century, early 20th. Uh, into the picture comes Alice Seeley. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of Alice Seeley before, I don't know much about her work, but uh, hopefully this um, slideshow will give you a good overview and hopefully you'll learn some things if you have heard of that uh, before. So, this really, um, she's one of the celebrated women of Fru, and I don't know how many of you might have been down to the Fru Museum, but um, there's about 20 women that's been celebrated, people like Christina Mazzetti, Elizabeth Rowe, Mavis Tate, uh, an MP for Fru. So it's everybody that had a strong association with Froome, and, and Alice is one of them. It does say 10th of July. Um, if you think, oh, it's the 11th, I missed it. Due to popular demand, we've extended it for another week. So um, it, we close today, but uh, it opens again tomorrow, and you've got until Saturday to see it. Uh, free of charge, donations welcome. But uh, that really was the background, and when I heard photo Froome, uh, was happening, we got together, Mick and myself, and we said, well, look, let's talk about Alice, which is why we're all here tonight. Well, let's talk about Alice. 
So Alice Seeley that, uh, that go through. Uh, this is down by Silk, uh, Silk Mill, Saxon Bell. And in 2017, the uh, Fruit Society, on 27th of October, sorry, October 2017, a plaque was unveiled by the Fruit Society for Local Study. And the Fruit Society for Local Study has got quite a few plaques up around the town. And um, they say one was put up for, for Alice. Now the reason it was put where it is, is that um, she was born in Marsbury in 1870, but in 1882 her father, Alfred, came down with his family to um, the silk mill to become their manager. So the Thompson Le Gros uh, silk um, factory, he became their manager, which is why Alice came down at the age of 12. And um, this was the house that they lived in. If I just go back, where you see the arrow, that would have been a house, that would have been number three, Merchant's Bark, and um, right next to the silk mill, so he didn't have much of a, a trek to go to work each morning. Um, the people in the, the um, picture, that's the Free Society, and um, they say put the plaque up there. So, sorry, I'll just read that. So, so you can see from the plaque, it says, Alice Seeley, later Lady Hacks, and I'll talk about that in a minute, anti-slavery campaigner, photographer, missionary, um, missionary to the Congo, artist, scourge of King Leopold II of the Belgians, and lived at three merchants, Bar Bar merchants Barton, sorry, um, between 82 and 88. So um, just a, an overview very quickly. She was here uh, until she was about 18, left to go to London, joined the civil service. At the same time, she took evening classes um, within uh, learning how to be a missionary or, or missionary classes. She met her husband, future husband, later Sir uh, John Hobbes Harris, and they were Baptist missionaries in the Congo Free State when they finally got out there. I think it took seven years of trying, but they finally um, went out there in the early 20th century. Many graphic lectures, as Mick has said, um, but we we'll come to that in a minute. But um, this is the reason that she has the plaque where she does, because of what she achieved in a lifetime. So, um, as you can see, where the bottom arrow is, this is um, where Merchant Barton would have been. It would have been a row of houses. And you can see just across the road that now goes down to Marks and Spencer's, that didn't exist. Uh, and in fact, Saxon Bell didn't exist. Saxon Bell was a 1970s, 1980s name uh, given to fruit to try and say a little bit about Saxon past. The other arrow is where the silk mill was, and you can see some of the workers. Uh, 1900, this was taken, so around about the same time, just after um, Alice had left for London. This is Alice, aged 100, uh, and in 1969, when she was 99, she left and was living in Guildford at the time. She came back later to Froome for quite a while with her husband, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, she wrote to a newspaper in 1969, and she wrote about memories growing up in the town. She remembered seeing Vicar Bennett. Those of you who know anything about Froome history, Vicar Bennett was quite a controversial vicar when he came down. But she remembered seeing him passing by in his cap and gown. Uh, in 1882, the early 1880s. He'd been here since 1852, and I think passed away in 1886, it says. So, towards the end of life. She remembered being at the old art school in North Parade, and John Webb Singer, Singers, the statue of the foundry, um, praising her art, because he was a governor there, we believe. And he becomes very important in a minute, when um, Mick and myself were talking just now, something kind of clicked, so I'll tell you about that in a minute. And she also recalled Clara Grant, who was a fellow student, we think three years ahead. She'd been born in 1867, and um, Fru has every reason to be proud of her as well. So we just have a very quick um, diversion. Clara Grant was a social reformer. Those of you that know, uh, come on my courses, or come on celebrated women walks. Number six, North Parade, um, there's a plaque there. She started the first street settlement and also a thing called the Farthing Bundle. She recycled material to make toys for children and they would pay a farthing, the lowest denomination, but she wanted something, so they valued the toys. Um, you can see them all queuing up to get their toys. It became so popular, she introduced the archway and it says, Enter all ye children's small 
none can come in who are too tall. Um, because it was so popular, they only had a certain amount of toys. But uh, in the end, they did start another scheme for taller, older children. But uh, just touching on Clara Grant, what I did find with the celebrated women research is there are a lot of overlap. Uh, Christina Rossetti, New Emma, or possibly New Emma Shepherd, who was a social reformer. Alice Seeley, probably knew, uh, well, she would have known Betty Trask's uh, grandfather, but we're getting too much disruption now, um, as saying. Once I get talking about it, you can't stop me. But, um, oh, Christina Rossetti, um, Clara Grant went there as well, uh, later on, after the Rossettis had left. But uh, back to Alice Seeley, she left through in 1888, went to London, trained for the civil service, as we said, attended missionary classes. Here she met John Harris, married in 1898, and spent their honeymoon on the SS Camera, a three-month journey to the Congo Free State, where they were posted as missionaries. Now, at the time, King Leopold of Belgium, the Congo Free State, was agreed by the League of Nations in 1884-85. It was a personal fiefdom of Leopold, who was the cousin of Queen Victoria. The Congo Free State was managed through the Anglo, Anglo, Belgian India Rubber Company, the ABRR. What she discovered there, to a, um, a great horror, was that the natives were being beaten, that what was um, required, because of Dunlop, John Dunlop had invented the rubber tire, and rubber was the big commodity. And so, I think it was about two billion rubber plants, I believe, but it was a huge, I think the Congo Free State is the second largest um, country in, in Africa, the 11th largest in, in the world. And um, when they arrived, they found that the um, Congolese, the native Congolese, if they didn't produce their quotas, then they would be punished. Uh, Leopold had an army of about 16,000 mercenaries, and uh, they were told whatever it takes to get the quotas, they would do. And it involved that amputation, it involved village burning, kidnapping, etc. These are some of the images, images that you're going to see um, this evening. But um, Alice realised that only by photographing these horrors would she be believed, or at least that's what she, she thought, and she probably was right. And so says she'd been given it as a honeymoon present, but again, this is maybe traditional narrative, uh, part of the mythology. And um, Mick and myself were talking before, we think that possibly it was somebody already in the, the Congo that gave her this, um, the German model, as opposed to the Kodak. But she used the camera um, to take hundreds of pictures of the atrocities, and the photographs were then shipped back to England. Now, what is interesting is we mentioned John Webb Singer, and the Singer's fact, um, factory, the foundry, very many famous statues came out of the Singer's factory. And we were just saying, um, I think, am I right to say, that the German camera would have used glass plate negatives? And we just wondered where, you know, she might have learned to, um, to kind of, well, she became quite an expert in that. So we just wondered where she might have learned that. And it clicked because in 1902 she came back, she corresponded with John Webb Singer while she was away. So they become very, uh, they maintained the relationship that they, they started um, when he was a governor at the art school. And when she came back, she was shown around his factory and um, she was shown sections that she writes in the 1969 article, Bodicea and the Daughters. Maybe the horses and chariots, uh, which would eventually end up in the embankment in London. There you can see, a very famous statue. But what is interesting, anybody that knows the history of singers, they were meticulous in taking photographs of all their statues. Uh, in fact, there was about 10,000 glass plate negatives that were taken over the period of time they had uh, at the height of their foundry. Um, and in fact, a lot of those, uh, this is for a different talk, but a lot of those were being thrown out into a skip one day when somebody rushed out from the office and uh, managed to save 3,000 of them. Um, but that's a different talk, which uh, I might well be giving later on because we've got an exhibition coming up soon about single glass plate negatives. But um, 
Anyway, this is where she may well have been taught how to take good photographs, how to develop the uh, glass plate negatives or whatever the process is. But um, she was here temporarily in 1902, goes back and then starts to take more photographs. Initially her images were used in Regions Beyond, which was the magazine of the mission that um, they were uh, uh, part of. But then in 1904 the photographs reached wider distribution, including Congo Avery, a pamphlet prepared by Mrs. H. Grant McGuinness, wife of the editor of Regions Beyond, and King Leopold's Row in Africa by E.D. Morell. And uh, this is this is a, a duplicate, kind of a fast, um, a kind of later reproduction of it. But um, this was the book that really started everything off because they got involved then with the, um, the Congo Reform Association when it started in 1904. And when they came back to England, as you've heard, they started to um, take the images around um, on lecture tours. They went to America, Europe, and England. And uh, Mark Seeley, who we'll talk about in, in a minute, um, he said what was interesting is, is the photographs actually um, were very performative. They, they, they weren't just um, documents, evidence of the atrocities, they actually worked almost for their living. When they went on tour, they worked because as Mick said, there's a narrative behind it, a whole story. So it was almost, as he calls it, a performance. But. Um, they say they started uh, working for the Congo Reform Association. So later, John Harris would write the American tour that they presented Alice's images in 200 meetings in 49 cities via magic lantern screenings. And, uh, and then in 1906, the New York uh, American paper used Alice's photographs to illustrate articles in the Congo for an entire week. So basically, this was the period of time where it shook, shook the world, basically. So um, in 1908, they became joint organizing secretaries of the Congo Reform Association, and then April 1910, joint organizing secretaries of the Anti-Slavery and Aborigines Protection Society. Along with help from celebrities such as Conan Doyle, Mark Twain, as we've mentioned, the movement successfully pressurized King Leopold to sell, and that's the, he, had, he sold it to the, um, to the Belgian government, ended the abuses pe perpetrated under his rule. But uh, again, this is one of the things we we'll discuss later. It wasn't given back to the Congolese, but it was sold on, basically. Um, they did go back later on, and the, um, the conditions had improved, um, and then Alice retired, she started a family, they had four children between them, or four children, and um, they retired and came back to Fru. John became an MP in 1923. He'd stood in 1922 and lost. He became Hackney North MP in 1923 for a year. Then the 24 election, he lost that. Stood again in 29, stood again in 31, lost both of those, and then never stood again for, uh, for Parliament. But he was there for a, a year, and um, a little bit later, he was knighted for his services um, to the anti-slavery movement. And a lot of people uh, have not criticized him getting it, but the fact that Alice didn't get what was felt due recognition for what she'd achieved. Um, Alice did continue her active speaking though. Uh, she was alongside influential Brits like Winston Churchill and Ernest Shackleton. Uh, but they came back to fruit and they were up in Stonelands, let me see it here. This is on the way out to the college, um, but they also owned quite a lot of properties at the top down in Willow Vale. And um, there's five houses called Riverside Terrace, and John Harris had those built. You can see a plan um, up on the top row. So they had quite a lot of property in Froome, and they lived here um, for quite a long time. John actually died in the garden here in Stonelands, in 1940, he had a cerebral hemorrhage and um, died in the garden just inside there. But she carried on living here for a while and then in the end ended up in um, Guildford. But so uh, there's a picture of them in their house. Lady Harris was a member of the Fruit Society for Local Study, which was founded in 1958. 
and uh, became their first uh, centenarian uh, member. And she had four children, one of which was Catherine Ashworth. And um, Catherine was heavily involved in the society as well. And when she passed away in 1974, she left her house, she bequeathed her house in Wine Street to um, the society. This became um, Society HQ for a while and also the location of the Free Museum. Um, it was originally on church steps, moved to Wine Street, and then its third site is where it is now in the old um, Literary and Scientific Institute uh, building. The only recompense Catherine asked for was a rose to be placed on a grave each midsummer. And um, midsummer is just gone, and there's the rose which um, Frim Society went up. We had a little ceremony on the vice chairman of the Frim Society, um, by the way, and we went up and we placed the rose uh, on her grave. Alice's achievements were often overlooked or overshadowed in favour of her husband when she was alive, and this continues at death as well. You can see that she's just the daughter of St John Harris and widow of Norman, no mention of Alice at all. But things are changing in terms of Alice. Uh, we've obviously got the plaque now. There's a biography, don't call me lady. She never liked to be called lady after her husband had been knighted. Um, by Judy Pollard Smith, and she's one of the celebrated women of Froome in the exhibition, as I mentioned. Many of her images, though, that shocked the world have been the subject of exhibitions in the 21st century as well. The most uh, probably notable is the brutal exposure at Liverpool's International Slavery Museum, uh, and also the work of Mark Seeley. And we did try to get Mark to come down, he was going to come down to talk, but we couldn't get the dates sorted, but um, he did send um, his, his best wishes. And um, his work is very um, interesting in how he, how he kind of um, analyzes um, her images. Um, this is one you can see on YouTube. Uh, how you examine troubling images, and her legacy is troubling in certain areas, but um, it says, it's not without controversy, which we were now Discuss. I think that's the last one. So yeah, this is slide. So I hope that's been informative, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Alice when we have the discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on the history of Alice before I get to the next stage? Was that pretty clear? Okay. So a um, couple of things about how this work got presented. When it was first shown in London. Um, it was deemed inappropriate material for a lady to be presenting. So even though Alice had taken the photographs, her husband uh, presented them. Which is quite an interesting insight in its own right. Um, although it pretty quickly became clear that Alice was probably better presented than her husband John. She, she took over. Um, Second point is, is, I think it's probably clear that there's a lot of Alice's history that isn't completely documented. And there's, there's bits of it in all of these books, and everything we've told you so far is as accurate as we know how to make it. But there are definitely a few things that are unknown, and we may well end up doing something a bit more serious on that, uh, to try and do a proper biography, go through it in more detail. So, the photographs. It's a huge body of work, um, but there were 60 in the slide presentation that were used, and they were fairly consistent, 60. And it was, it was a typical slide presentation, it was sort of set up, here's, here's where the Congo is, um, here's what's happening at the moment, here's how Leopold got to be in charge of it, um, and here are the atrocities that are happening, and here's what should happen. Interesting, it was framed in two ways. Uh, which are both slightly controversial. It was framed as philanthropy, because when Leopold took over and created the Congo Free State, it was supposedly to help the local people as a philanthropic effort, but it didn't turn out to be that. But the presentation that Alice and John pitched was pitched as philanthropy, philanthropy as it is, how it could be, and so on, which is in itself an interesting insight in how it worked. The second thing that was interesting <coughs> and possibly this was because of its time. Um, it was very clear um, 
that Alice and John were campaigning against the atrocities. But what they were not campaigning against was, or, or for I should say, was freedom for the Congolese people. Because at that time, it was days of empire. And although they were missionaries, in many ways, the missionaries were also an outpost of empire. The missionary task was not to particularly have a conversation with local people, it was to convert them that their way was the right way. That was all part of the process at that time. Um, there's another fact which is interesting, if you study the timeline. Alice and John were part of the Bolola uh, Missionary Association, Congo Bolola Missionaries. That's how they started in 1899. However, that had been in existence since 1888, which was also the time when Leopold started, in all seriousness, with the rubber, which coincided with Dunlop's uh, patents on the pneumatic tire. So from 1980, sorry, 1888, if you get that wrong, 1888 until the time when Alice and John got there in 1899, 2000, there were missionaries on site and the atrocities were still happening. They were obviously captivating worse, but it is a piece of history that's overlooked. And I think it's important to extract the photographs. So when Alice started taking the photographs, it wasn't just recording something that was there, it was something that, wow, how am I finding this right now? How is this going on? How has it got to be so severe? How did he get this back, basically? So here we go. I've got 10 of these slides to show. Um, and the first are sort of set-up slides. These, these are actually after the time of the slideshow, but it's to show more the, the sense of what it was like in colonial Africa. You've got, got John, here. Actually, I've got a portrait of this thing. Technology, there's John. And there's Alice, surrounded by rather happy faced people. Um, obviously, with the cameras, you had to stay still, otherwise, it was all blurred, so nobody smiled. But that probably wasn't the only reason they weren't smiling. So that was kind of typical. And here's another one about that time when they went back to the Congo, the colonial tea party, uh, the veranda. Remember that veranda because it's got part of the story when I show you the last image. I think it's the same veranda. Now this one is interesting and somewhat controversial again. This is in the middle of the campaign. This is Alice. We don't quite know who took it, but it was probably John. Alice, to be honest, is doing the white savior act. She is white, surrounded by young black African kids. That is not a photograph you would take today. And frankly, if it was, people would be quite upset, quite rightly. But it does demonstrate what was going on at that time in the environment that all this was taking place. It was taking place in an environment of empire and colonialism. Can I read a couple of things? Of um, this is um, from Mark Seeley, who um, this is about this particular um, image. But ultimately, there's still the kind of legacy of who she was or thought she was in relation to this hierarchical positionality that she saw herself in as this incredible, if you like, privileged white person literally on top of the pile of Congolese children, how she framed herself in this incredible moment of kind of, one might say, benevolent colonial arrogance. This is Mark Seeley. Um, and we mentioned, I did mention this book. Um, it's not a straightforward biography as such. Um, Judy Pollard Smith is, is taking it upon herself to fictionalize um, a lot of what she believed Alice might say based on research, but with, a, with that type of genre, you don't know then what, um, you can't really rely on the narrator. But there is a, um, a section where she's got Alice speaking in 1965, looking back on this hillside photograph. And this is what Judy says Alice would have been thinking. Some say that photographs that are contrived lose their truth. I disagree. It is the truth that has made me do this. It was truth that made me see that knocked the scales off my eyes. Like the former slaver, John Newton, I do believe that I went from blindness to sight 
And like John Newton, I can say that it was his amazing grace that made that happen. I did the footwork, the arranging of the shot, and John snapped the shutter, in poured the light. I arranged myself with the children in a pyramid shape, with me at the top of that grassy knoll, the children spread beneath me seated on the hillside. Rather than me being the one who held up the others, was it the Congolese people who were the ones supporting me? Did I see myself as their better? Is that why I was on the top? Or as their great white mother? No, I have come to realize that it is they who have guaranteed me a place in this life, in this awful history. It was the children, you see. We loved them, they loved us, and I suffered tremendous guilt about that since my own children were back home. She had four children by then. It wrapped me in sorrow. Sorry, a couple of apologies. Whom was I to serve? So I arranged this photo for full effect. Photos presented in this manner drove our message home clearly when we sent them back to Britain. Look at them, all bony limbs hungry. Most of them were orphaned by the time I took this and me at the top looking so sad. Now, as I said, it's kind of fictionalised, not sure whether she would have thought this or Julie's put that in her mind, but um, just to give two um, different perspectives. Thank you. No problem. Um, when you look at a photograph, there's always at least three people involved. There's the photographer, there's the subject, and there's the audience. And they're not necessarily all the same thing. And these days you also get editors, you get critics, you get lots of other people involved. And the other thing that happens with a photograph is it changes its meaning over time. Uh, it's, a, it's a time capsule and meanings change. And so when we look at these pictures, we have to bear all of those things in mind when we're judging it. It's a picture of its time, but it's also a picture you can analyze in so many different ways. It's not to detract at all from what Alice did that was good, but it's not necessarily an image that I particularly have in my portfolio. Moving on. This is uh, John preaching. Um, it's, a, it's a documentary shot. It's actually nicely composed, like all of Alice's work. She obviously knew how to uh, work the camera. It's nicely focused. Um, the lighting is good, etc., etc., etc. But this is basically John preaching, telling things as they are, or as they should be. <coughs> These are the, uh, some of the centuries from the ABIR, the Anglo-Belgian uh, India Rubber Company. As uh, David said, they're all mercenaries. And this is um, a prisoner. Uh, at the moment, he's okay because he's, in, uh, he's just manacled, no more. Uh, but the same centuries, um, caused all kinds of problems. These are two women that are being taken captive by the same kinds of centuries. Uh, centuries. So the process was this. Everybody was given a quota of rubber to collect. And if you didn't collect your quota of rubber, then there was punishment. First on the spouse, which was always the wife, obviously, then on the children. So if you didn't meet your quota, you knew the family was going to suffer. Then, of course, if you yourself had suffered and you couldn't make the quota, then everybody, it all got worse. So that was the sort of process that was going on. And if they didn't pay their taxes, which is effectively again to do with the rubber industry, they were manacled. Again, you can look at this picture many, many different ways. You can look at it as a portrait photograph, if you're a photographer, and you can say, actually, that's a pretty decent portrait photograph of its time. It's well put together, it's well composed, it's well lit. <coughs> then you say, well, what's the content of that photograph? Well, it's obviously a pretty unfortunate content, very mean. Then you ask yourself, well, what's the backstory? What's happening to these people? How did they get to this state? And where are they going to go? And then you've got the dimension of time. How do we now view that as to how we would treat people? How they were treated then. So time has changed the way we look at it. So when you look at a photograph, it isn't as simple as saying that's a photograph of a couple of people in a village. It's got all kinds of meanings you can unpack. And this is a posed picture. Uh, obviously, this happened. 
Uh, right. And then another interesting fact about quite a few of Alice's photographs, and she wouldn't be alone in this at this time, was the posing of pictures. Remember that photograph I showed you of Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner in the, in the Civil War in uh, America? Um, it's known that Alexander moved some of the bodies around to make it a better composition. That wouldn't happen these days again, but it did happen because they were trying to get a composition that worked. So, again, should we accept the post picture, however, as a false representation of reality? Well, no, because it actually happened. So you've got this interesting dilemma in your head about, I know I can't really believe this picture because it's posed, and you know, a photograph is never supposed to lie, but we all know that they do. But at the same time, it is representing reality. So it's the difference really between what I call documentary, telling a story, a journalism where you're supposed to tell the absolute truth and nothing else. And that's the distinction between the two branches of photography. Um, and then this. As we mentioned, uh, one of the punishments, if you didn't make the quota, was the severing of limbs. And then it was taken out on the kid. In this case, Moller, uh, the hand had been destroyed by gangrene because of the way his hands had been wrapped up. But Yorke's sister, that was because, well, the soldiers had another target. They were given the target to collect rubber, therefore they had to get that from the Congolese people. But they were also given targets of targets. How many have you done? You know, like a National Health Service target? Have you got to 20%, 50% or whatever? Same kind of thing. They had quotas to fulfill of how many punishments they actually inflicted. And if they didn't inflict the number of quota punishments that they should, they arbitrarily cut people's hands off. And that was all part of the process. But again, on another level, as a photograph, it's a very well-made photograph. This is another one, a uh, young woman. Again, that raises all kinds of other questions. Why should this woman be naked? Why should you show her that way? Where is the dignity and respect in the photograph? But again, it is actually what happened. This one is interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a circular image. Now, the images in any of these magic lanterns were not square, they were sort of circular, that's kind of how it worked. But you can see from the framing of all the others, they were more traditional landscape photographs. This is circular. It's quite likely this was taken by the first Kodak, not the second one, because the first Kodak created circular images. That was how it worked. The next one, the Browning Kodak, created more like a traditional 120 film image for the photographers in the audience. So it is quite likely that Alice was using a Kodak because she wouldn't have got that photograph from one of the plate cameras that she was using. So there's a clue in the story as well. There's another clue. This is a Swedish missionary. So it wasn't just British missionaries. There was a lot of activity going on, a lot of missionaries trying to do their work. There was a whole international interest by this time. This is 1904, right? Yeah. Um, there was a lot of interest in what was going on. And this one, and we spent some time on this one. This is the last one we're going to show, and then we're probably going to have a bit of a break. Um, so this picture, the Um He had a wife and daughter. The daughter's name is Boiling. And he had a son. I'm sorry, I don't know the son's name. I've not been able to find the son's name. And um, the militia decided that some kind of um, penalty needed to be made. So they murdered his wife, his son, and his daughter. And what you see in front of him are what is remaining of his daughter. Because one of the slides, actually two of the slides, in the original 60 that Alice had put together, talked about the cannibalism uh, in, in the Congo. And Mark Seeley would rightly say, this is all part of the African myth. It's exotic, it's ethnographic, and it's awful. Which, of course, is not true. But that was all part of the myth. But sadly, this is one part of the myth that is true. It is very likely that what happened was these three people, the mother, the daughter, and the son, had been killed and 
though there was indeed a carnival feast. What happened was that Sala found what was left of the bodies and actually he picked them up. And remember the picture I said with the veranda? He actually took them to where Alice and John were. This is the remains of my family. No, I'm making the words up, I don't know what was said. But that, that seems to be the sequence of what happens when you piece together the history. And then Alice got him to pose with his daughter. Now that raises a whole bunch of other questions. You know? On one hand, you want to show the atrocities, you want the world to know what's happening. But do you really have a right to get somebody to pose with the remains of their child so you can take a photograph? Now I guess, on balance, it worked. Because Leopold was indeed kicked out of the Congo and the atrocities stopped. And in that sense, Alice is a total hero. Which is also a product of the time. And po posing photographs was very much what was going on. I'm pretty sure if she was here today, she would do any such thing. But then it was part of what was going on, partly because of the technology. You couldn't get a, a snap in a split second. You had to wait seconds, sometimes longer, to get the image. So that's what happened. And this is probably the most reproduced image, together with the uh, pyramid image that you'll see of Alice's. We were very lucky. The anti-slavery international people and panels have helped us to put this together. And we talked about it in the future. So, if anybody's got any immediate questions on that bit, I'd be happy to answer. I imagine it's a bit of a time for a break, actually. Can I, can I just ask one question? Sure. I'm curious as to why um, the people actually mutilated the bodies of the people who were killed. Because they were working as a producing brother when you cut the handle and the feet off. The answer is I don't know the answer to that question. I just, I was just curious. No, I've been, I've been curious. Bizarre. It is a bizarre thing to do, and I, I actually don't know. No, it's okay. Can I just answer that? If I may, I think it was more the children and the wives of, of the men. So yeah. it was the men had to produce the quota, and if they didn't produce oh, it, yeah, right. then then it would be their families that. Um, but just one point you mentioned, Nick, about um, they had they had, the mercenaries had quotas as well. Um, one story I, I read that um, I think they had. A lot of the time, they had to bring back um, certain parts of the body to show how many bullets they they spent, because a lot of the time they may have been shooting animals on hunts, and so they they themselves had to bring back to show that they'd used 50 bullets for saying this is you know what we did with it or, or various. That's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm kind of curious the fact that. We we're assuming that she didn't enter into some sort of uh, conversation with um, the, the father there, and that she explained this would be a very powerful way to send the message back. So he, he may have been in agreement with her approach. Um, it is absolutely true that you can look at Alice's photographs and see collaboration between subject and photographer. But you could see that in all of these photographs. Uh, there's no question about that. She was working with. Uh, the subject, and that she should be applauded. But I don't think there's any record of, uh, as I said right at the beginning, of an attempt to somehow free the people of the Congo in some big campaign. Uh, maybe, to, maybe to stop the atrocities, but it was not, it's not actually a, uh, a campaign to liberate the Congo. It was about stopping one kind of atrocity. And in fact, the last slide of Alice's 60, which I don't think I mentioned yet, was a recommendation that the British government take over the Congo by force. Okay. So, um, I think it's a fair question, Martin, but I actually, I don't think there's much evidence to suggest that the people that this was happening to really understood the, the context of the campaign. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Congo didn't get its independence for another 50 years, I think. 1960. 1960, yeah. yeah. Any other questions, Chris? Okay, so what I'd suggest then, maybe give people time for a bit of a pause and reflection, uh, get a drink, and then um, we're happy to talk a lot more about Alice if you want, but also more generally about photographic ethics or how it's been used in documentary, even how it's used today. So 
Have a drink and come back to some questions. Thank you. Thank you. So one thing um, I would say, just to not necessarily to put in context, but uh, when we talk about how many people died in the Congo, there is no accurate numbers, but uh, it has been estimated that 50% of the population at the time um, were killed, and that equates to 10 million people. Um, so even more, not comparing um, obviously genocides, but um, when you put that in perspective, 10 million people throughout Leopold's reign was, uh, were, were murdered um, and, and lost their lives. So, yeah, it's a good fact for anything. Um, Right, so I realise that we've covered an awful lot of ground um, because there's an awful lot coming. So, um, does anybody have any thoughts about a particular part they'd like to talk about, ask questions about, have concerns about? Or have we just put everybody to sleep? Cool. Yeah? I was only going to ask whether there was any relationship with Conrad. Heart of Darkness. Mm. With, sorry, with? Conrad, Heart of Darkness. That was about the Conquer, wasn't it? Yes, it was. He wrote that around, I'm not sure the exact date, but a similar kind of time as um, the soliloquy, I think. Yeah, it was by it, 1904, I think. I think he um, obviously fictionalised and then obviously later made it into uh, uh, Apocalypse Now. But um, I think, from what I understand, Conrad actually worked, he, he worked out there. Um, for one of the companies, I think, and then, and then wrote the book. But yeah, definitely, that was part, let's say, part of the literature that came out of that, that period of time. Anything else? Yeah, one over there. Lock up. There's a few things I could add here, but the first is to say that, uh, you know, when we discuss our history of colonialism and imperialism in Britain, there's still a few that we were a benevolent power, we brought many benefits to those countries we ruled, etc. But in Belgium's case, it's pretty clear cut because this was their colony and we know what they did there. And on the edge of Brussels, there's a place called the Musée Royal de la Africaine, it's in Terburen. I highly recommend it to people if they're on a trip to Brussels, take the tram out there, it's a lovely tram ride. And there's an old palace that was built in 1903 for a colonial exhibition. And it used to house one of the finest collections of tribal and ethnographic art anywhere. Uh, but it was a source of shame to most Belgians. And the collection declined and became dusty and the building dilapidated. But they closed in 2010 for a big refurbishment. And uh, it's got great items of African art. If you know tribal art, any book of African art will have illustrations in it of items from the collection in, in Brussels. It's amazing. Uh, but when they closed and reopened, like three years, way over budget, over time, they set aside a couple of galleries to describe the atrocities they'd done and to <coughs> apologise for it. And in fact, the King of Belgium pointedly did not go to the opening ceremony because he didn't want to be associated with the atrocities and he chose to go to the museum later. But that's one aspect in relation to Belgian colonialism. They do recognise it. There is a real attempt to try and Repaint, re accurately repaint the history and uh, describe it at, at the museum. So, anyone on a trip to Brussels recommended to you. Can I, can I pick that up? Because you just gave me a great lead in to show the next slide. <laughs> this is in 1923. It's in Nigeria. Miller Brothers. I can't remember the name of the young couple down in this bottom corner. But that was their Christmas card. 1923, Merry Christmas. So, if anybody thought that the British were doing everything right, they're a bit wrong. And I think the idea of confronting the past before you can move forward is really kind of an interesting point. Um, this is a very horrible picture. Ironically, it's quite a well taken picture, it's quite well composed and all that other stuff, uh, but it's a pretty horrible indication of how these people thought. And in terms of confronting the past, you may or may not know about this, a lot of 
photographers um, aspire to be photographers for the National Geographic. Obviously they have wonderful magazines, they've got a fantastic history, fantastic quality photographs, research, and so on and so forth. And look, you, maybe you can't see the date. This is 2018. And the National Geographic, Venice, all credit to them, came back and realized that what they were doing was taking a lot of photographs with what's called the colonial or white gaze. So, in, in photography circles, when you think about how you take a photograph, we all somehow get worried about taking photographs in the street through of other people, but we have no such hesitation taking pictures of people on our safari in Tanzania, uh, because we look at it a different way. We treat people a different way. And that's a small indication of this idea of gaze. So the National Geographic photographers were all thinking they were doing a great job. In many ways, they were. But they were just looking at things from, effectively, what for many, many decades was a career of white male journalists from North America. And that was how they were viewing the world. So I think all credit to National Geographic, they realized that and wanted to do something about it. But I, I think it goes to the same point, my God, unless you confront what happened realistically, without any kind of uh, trying to you know, cover things over, you can't really move forward very well. But also, can I say one thing? Sure, of course. And that, as I say, to move forward, you need to say acknowledge, you have to move on. But unfortunately, this, this is um, something that was written in 2002 by a politician. The, the problem, this is about problems in Africa. The problem is not that we were once in charge, but that we are not in charge any longer. Colonialism in Africa should not have ended, and British Britain's role in slavery can easily be dismissed. Now the thing is, the politician, I was going to say who actually wrote that, but we're having a Boris Johnson free evening, but it was Boris Johnson in 2002. Oh, God. Uh, so this is what one is against when you're trying to confront the past, that the past is still living making plans for the future and, and obviously not getting into the whole Churchill uh, debate but you know Churchill is Boris Johnson's idol and so notions of empire, notions of colonialism, you know there are still those out there that believe Britain still got an empire um, and as I said this was written in 2002 but um, one would su be surprised if his attitude had changed well, since true. then. Never hold an idea for more than two minutes anyway. So. Um, just quickly back to Alice. There is no suggestion in anything where any of us are saying to kind of dismiss Alice's achievement because she was absolutely spot on with what she was trying to do with the atrocities. And she succeeded. And she succeeded in a really big way. There's a there is a uh, there's a modern current in photography called socially engaged photography. And what that means is you're trying to work in a collaboration with your society or community, trying to put forward a, you know, somebody's problems or whatever. And you feel like you're doing it for a good cause, basically. To be honest, I find that a little bit self-serving too many times. However, when I look at somebody like Alice, or actually Lewis Hine, who I quoted, the photographer from the States, they actually use their photography to make a really big difference. And nothing we're saying about colonialism or anything else should detract from that, because that was a huge achievement, and it changed the world. Um, but again, you have to acknowledge the past. So, if I'm allowed to show one more picture? Yeah, I, mean, more. I would just say... you got another question, I would. Sorry, you go. No, all I was going to say, Mick, was, as Mick said, yeah, in no way would we put Alice down. I mean, Fruit should be rightly proud of her, and anything that we can do to put her back into the history books because she is, by, um, by the kind of absence, you know, a glaring admission. So we're trying to change that. And one thing I did forget just to say um, in 2018, nevertheless, productions, uh, Peter Clark played King Leopold, and in Rook Lane, they, they actually reenacted um, the soliloquy. Uh, Peter Clark um, recited it, and Alice's great granddaughter. 
was actually in the audience and then took part in the question and answers after. So Froome should definitely celebrate Alice and um, get her back or put her in the history books where she deserves her place. Yeah. Just a question. Um, how, is there any indication of how I communicate? I'm very loud. So it's no. terrible. Uh, uh, Martin's very insistent. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, is there any indication of how, how she was supposed to communicate with the, the local Congolese? So I'm, uh, based on level of education, French probably wasn't widely spoken at the time. I mean, I, my big issue with this is how can you be a collaborator if you can't, if you can't actually communicate to someone yeah, how to well collaborate? Know, do you know? And I'm also <laughs> really worried, just to finish off my thought, that actually, and so I, I live in East Africa at the moment, and I think even where we are uh, now with the, way, the, 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 the level of understanding of uh, many people on the street, the street for how these things can actually affect change, um, given the way that local governments are viewed, um, you know whether people would, would believe that having a picture taken would have any kind of influence. So I think that and making that case would be incredibly difficult 120 years ago, okay. even if it is even more so now. I mean, my my thought would have been. I mean, when they went in, they, they weren't like Livingstone or, or Stanley discovered it for the first time. I mean, as, as Mick said, the missions, and there were six of them, certainly within that particular uh, organisation, and there would have been a network, I would think, un underneath that support system. Um, although, having said that, I think out of the original 36 that went in um, 1888 or 1887, or whatever it was, I think only five of them survived. Um, there was a lot of death, a lot of... Um, Kind of disease out there, but I think there would have been a support system, so there would have been probably translators. Again, the, that, that particular last image we saw, the, the mythology around it also, um, what I read was that um, she actually was taken there, or he was, you know, she was taken and then he was brought back to, to have the photograph. But the, the Congolese were very um, insistent that, you know, they could see maybe what this was going to be. Uh, happening, but having said that, if they had no concept of, of photography, but as I say, certainly there would have been a support system there with translators, and um, they've been there at least 20 years, I would have thought. So but, if, that, if that answers, I'm uh, not sure that does answer. But, but, uh, yes. <laughs> sorry, if I can, just one, if I can pick up your point. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say. Um, sorry. This, this lady's grandmother was a missionary. My my grandparents were missionaries in, in Africa and in Congo in the 1900s, and my parents were also. Learning the language was crucial. My grandfather spoke seven languages, so I would be very surprised if they didn't actually learn the local languages. They'd be lots of fun, but I'd be very surprised if they didn't. That, that's my hunch, anyway. Thank you. The only thing I was going to say on top of that was that uh, it is pretty clear that that the Sala did go to Alice to explain what was going on. That seems to be pretty clear. Of the many things that are muddy in this story, that seems to be pretty clear. And the other thing I'd say is uh, maybe a hobby horse of mine, but this idea of socially engaged in collaboration, people say they collaborate and they're not really doing it, I completely buy that. That happens right now. I can give you 50 photographers planning to do that, and they're not really doing it. Um, I, my sense is that Alice was trying to do that to tell the story. Would we really call that collaboration? I'm not sure, but she was at least, I think, uh, trying to be respectful of the situation as far as you can tell from the photographs. So that's my addition to it. So. Is, <coughs> is Alice recognizable color? I don't think so. I'm not aware of it. No, I, I think, um, I know Mark Seeley, I think a couple of years ago, he was working with a Congolese photographer, and I think the whole episode is, uh, I think as he called it, had been lost from Congolese memory. And, and so I think they were trying to um, you know, bring that atrocity back, or, or that memory back, to, to kind of show people what, what, a little bit what we're doing um, with, with our past looking back. They were trying to do that there, but there was, there was certainly, a say, an absence of, of memory in the companies at that time. The thing I'd add to that is when we were trying to put this together uh, for, for this talk and also previously, uh, the Anti-Slavery Museum in Liverpool 
have contact with, believe it or not, there is a Congolese association in Liverpool. And I know that they were trying to kind of put all that together to, because they've done some big, big exhibitions like ours and the story. And they were trying to put that more into some kind of coherent form that could be taken back to the Congo. I do know that, but I don't think there's anything really happening in the Congo. I've got a question. Yeah, Celia? Um, Sorry, I'm fine. Just a second. Um, so I was just wondering, so you were saying when you took the photos they were sent back to be, were they being developed back in England or were they developed, I don't know how The answer it. is, we don't actually know. So I was wondering the, if anyone in the photos would have ever seen the photos. That's a really good question. Um, so what we actually do know is that she did occasionally use the Kodak. Mm -hmm. If it was the Kodak, that would have been sent back. Yeah. Okay? So okay. anything taken with the Kodak would have been sent back. Yeah. We, we think, because we can't be 100% certain, we think that that was the camera she was actually using. And actually, as we've been talking about it, the penny dropped. It's quite likely that she had some training in Fru with Singer, but we can't prove it. That's conjecture. That's next year's talk, right? Because that would be quite an interesting talk. If she did have that kind of training, it would be almost certain she'd probably done some developing on site. Yeah? If she didn't, it could have still been shipped back. There are references in the literature to planes being shipped to England. Mm -hmm. But it depends on the process she was using, whether they were processed plates mm -hmm. or yeah. plates to be processed. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not trying to skirt the issue. It's like we don't actually really know. But well, the only thing we do know is that she is a lot more of a photographer than people kind of suggest. Yeah, well, obviously she knew how to take She knew how to take photos, yeah. But then the developing is a whole nother. whole nother art, okay. yeah. Um, and then I was just wondering, so if they were being, wherever they were developed, were anyone in England seeing the pictures at the time? Or is it not till a long time later that they were seeing those? It was pretty, pretty quickly afterwards, because when they went back in 1902, was it? I think they... 1902, they went through. Yeah. Well, then 1901, they, so they took some of the first photographs in 1901 or something, and they appeared in magazines in the UK in 1902. The big push was in 1904, when the, when the Congo Reform Association um, started uh, with Morel, that was 1904, and that's when she'd taken these pictures. So they started to figure in that. So there was like a little bit of it in the 1901-2 time frame, and then there was like this big thing in 1904, and then there was a big campaign from four to six, and then Leopold left the Congo away. So the pictures were like being shared, so if they're being sent yeah, back to they were. being shared with Belgium. Is that like a public? No, not with Belgium, they were basically focused in the UK. So is that just the public, or is that just people who... It was a newspaper, in fact, um, let me get my cheat sheet. Um, I think it was in the magazine and the mission to begin with. Yes, it was. Um, was it beyond? It was in, uh, yeah, Regions Beyond, that's what it, yeah. And it was a magazine of the, of the mission. And that was 1901 to 1902. So they were in shared public. Yeah. But the slideshow campaign only started in 2004. Yeah. That's where the, kind of the big thing happened. Anybody else? No more questions? We're almost done. Can I show you one more picture then? Then we'll, then we'll call it tonight. Okay. Do you know that picture? Okay. So, um, this is by Kevin Carter. It won the Pulitzer Prize. As you can see, 1994. It was taken in 1993. When um, the photograph was taken, the belief was that that was a little girl. It turned out to be a little boy. And in fact, the little boy, at least a few years ago, was alive and well, fortunately. That's part of the story. And the name is Compion. Um, and it kind of tells the whole story. It has one significant flaw from a photographer's point of view, in that uh, Kevin moved around to change the composition to get the vulture in exactly the right place. And um, you could argue as a documentary, it makes sense what you do because you're trying to take pictures in the right place. 
but he also argued that the first priority is to help the child. And uh, he did actually help the child, and they're not directed the child was taken to a support center and survived. That's all part of the story. Um, it wasn't just because of this, but um, a couple of months after Kerry Carter won the Pulitzer Prize, he committed suicide because of the photography. He couldn't handle the kind of photographs he was having to take. So I show that, possibly to give the ultimate downer to the evening. <laughs> that was actually not the subject. But also to show that some of these issues about how you take an ethical photograph and how you report and how you reflect on what's appropriate for people and what's your real mission? Is it to get the photograph or are you trying to help the people? They're very real subjects for a lot of photographers, most photographers these days actually. And I like because I'm going to show you one last picture because we've got a couple of minutes. And this is a different story. And you probably all know this picture. Okay? So, uh, Richard Drew taught us uh, on 9 11. And most of us have got sort of images seared into our head about what happened in 9 11. If you look at this picture as a picture, it's close to perfect. It's a, it's a body dissecting the two lines. It's pretty much in focus. It's well exposed. It hasn't been manipulated. It was a press picture. And it actually was what was happening. That's exactly what happened. People were making the choice between jumping and burning. And um, it was actually published straight away in the New York Times. But it was published once. Because for many years, the media self-censored that image because they didn't think it was appropriate to show. And one good argument why you shouldn't show it is that nobody knew who that person was. That's perhaps one reason to show it, but then there were quite a few people who did it. A less good reason to censor it was that this never happened. People didn't jump, which was also part of the narrative of the US at the time. Um, now, people show. But my point in showing this is that as I said, I think uh, a while back, in every photograph you've got at least three people involved. You've got the subject, you've got the audience, and you've got the photographer. And in this case, you've got the editors, got four people involved. And then you've got the government, five people involved. And if you look at a picture like that, one level you can say it's an iconic photograph. If you go through the list of iconic photographs of the, of the century, this will almost certainly make the list. Um, but on the other hand, it's a hugely controversial image in so many different ways. And in some, in some ways, it's that kind of image, to me, that's like the success of the wireless was doing. Because it raises a lot of the same kind of questions. And has a lot of the same kind of problems. Do we put it in the same category as that famous uh, photograph of a woman committing suicide from a hotel in New York? You know that one? The one falling down the uh, the No, it's in front of a, a, a coffee bar. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, and again, because of time, it's just become something we can now look at without it being so loaded. I, yeah, I know what you mean. I, personally, I don't think so, because this one is a global image. And I think that one is a more forgiving it's group. It, yeah, I think so. It's more of a local interest thing. Uh, sad though it is. This is, this is a global iconic image. And in fairness, just as the Kevin Carter images, mm. that will also feature on a lot of this. But it does show you some of the you know, things you have to think about when you're doing documentary photography. But we're talking, in terms of talking about grief, this is obviously right at one end, but having uh, spent three months in the People's Republic of Congo, and also in Brazil, in the, in the forest, and I've taken pictures there because you could crudely say, they're not quite ho holidays and that, but they're a record of the people we met and we worked with. Um, we were doing stuff on, on the rivers, just looking at the fish that came contained in the rivers, and they were our point of contact. But now I, you find yourself reviewing all that and saying, well, can you not show a picture unless you are on an exact equal with somebody? There's parity in every sense, um, in which case, where is the parity? Does it mean anybody in this country or just somebody in your economic bracket in another country. It's really <coughs> difficult to know now whether somebody else is going to look at that and say, oh, so you're taking pictures of the, the indigenous people and how do you think we're supposed to react to that? I mean, it's, 
It's a minefield. It's a complete minefield, and uh, there is no easy answer to that. But I think the most important thing is people ask the question about what it is they're trying to do. Mm. Lock up. I think another good example of an iconic photograph like that is uh, Nicholas Maypan Girl in Vietnam, which of course caused lots of controversy just because it showed the atrocities Americans were committed. They shouldn't have shown a girl naked like that. Uh, but ironically, and of course they could not go to surprise as well, but uh, Kim Fook, the girl in the photo, uh, migrated to the States and since then they couldn't have become friends and of course he's taken photographs of her, including the scars of her burns on her back and shoulders, etc. But that is a good example of an image that people said shouldn't be published, shouldn't be shown, and others of course would say, damn right it should. Yeah, you're right, because when that was published, the New York Times have very strict rules about nudity, and they have very strict rules about uh, children. And they took the actually quite brave decision to do it because it was in the public interest. The other part of that story, which is really important, is that Nick does not call it a pop girl. He actually calls the picture the terror of war, and nobody seems to want to use that name because it's so easy to call it a pop girl. And the other point is that after he took the picture, there were many photographers there actually, he wasn't the only one, he was also caught on video. He actually went to uh, Kim Cook, I think it is, and helped him. And he took her to the centre, and that's how they started to be friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think all credit to him for doing that. Mm -hmm. Which is not exactly the same story as happened in other situations. So, all credit to Nick on that. Anyway, um, I think we are at our allotted time. Do you have anything you want to say before we close? Just as I said, I know it's been um, quite a dang evening in certain uh, respects, but uh, at the end of the day, as I say, we have talked about Alice and it's really a celebration of her achievements as much as anything else. And so if you can take anything away with you, it's the fact, as I said earlier, that you know, she is one person that Froome can be proud of uh, with that association. And uh, we hopefully will go on celebrating her in whatever way we can. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I, could, if I could just add to that from the kind of photographic community side of things. It's our intention with Photo Fruit to uh, try to address some of these real issues going forward. And we might not get it right first time, we might need to keep reworking it. But we want to keep addressing these kinds of issues. And Martin's talking tomorrow with Joss about Martin is a, a fine art photographer, very good one too. Joss is an extremely successful commercial photographer. Most people think those two worlds don't meet, and uh, they actually will have an interesting conversation tomorrow at Rook Lane. So, to us, it's part of the exploration of photography and what it means, uh, and not just taking it at the superficial, at the pretty, but actually trying to dig into it, even when you don't have all the answers, because we don't have all the answers. And I just want to finally echo a really great partnership with the Group Museum, and we're going to keep doing more with that. Um, I also want to say, Alice was a, was a really important person in photographic history and actually in global history. And when we try to explore some of these issues, we still want to recognize that. But we just want to make sure that we don't walk past the other stuff. Because if you walk past the other stuff, you never really get to the truth. Anyway, thank you very and much. And just to plug the exhibition one last sorry, it's there till Saturday if you want to go and see it at Free Museum, 10 till 2 every day, free of charge and uh, several other celebrated women as well as Alice. Thank you.